just started reading through the book of Ezekiel this week, and it shows that God is so beyond what we can imagine. Reading through the original vision of Ezekiel seems so otherworldly. So, before we get to our main passage this morning, let me read this passage in Ezekiel for you to set up how amazing and beyond us God is, and how amazing and beyond us what He can do is. So sit back, relax, take in these words. If you want to, you can try to close your eyes and imagine it as we read through it, but again, this is something that is really beyond our imagination. We don't have a visual point of reference here with anything that we've physically seen in our lives, so it's a bit different, but uh, yeah, this is what Ezekiel says. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under the wings on their four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went. And the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight one toward another, and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. 
When they stood still, they let down their wings, and above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was the likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around, and downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of the rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking, and he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. Isn't that fascinating? I feel like there's enough mystery to capture our intrigue, but at the same time, there's so much glory to capture our awe. The radiance around God that's like a rainbow. The power that he has that these marvelous and potentially terrifying angelic beings move by his spirit. Sometimes I think of how people say that when John talks about certain things in Revelation, for instance, the locust creatures with human faces and lion's teeth and scorpion tails, that they might say, oh, that's John trying to describe a war plane or a helicopter, because John's never seen those things. He's never seen a war plane. He's never seen a helicopter. But when I read passages like this where Ezekiel sees these angels, which are called cherubim, by the way. This is what an actual cherub is like. It's not like Cupid. It's like this, right? So, but when I read this passage, passages like this as well, where these cherubim have all these faces and wings and there's these spheres with eyes all around them. I just think there's so much that we don't see or know about the spiritual realm, about God's whole creation. When I read stuff like this in Ezekiel, I think about what John said about those locust creatures, and I think they probably are locust creatures. God can do anything. He is unlimited in what he can bring forth and what he can do, and there are so much limits there are so many limits to our own mind of what we know about everything. Sometimes we take the Bible and we try too hard to make it fit our own framework. We might think, oh, that seems way too fantastical. It must be symbolic or, or a metaphor. And of course, I agree that there are definitely things in the Bible that are symbolic and are metaphorical, but I think it gets taken too far at times because we trust so much in our own limited minds rather than in the fact that we really know almost nothing compared to God. It might not sound possible that maybe God parted the Red Sea, maybe that doesn't sound possible to you. God parted the Red Sea, Israel walked across on dry land. It might not sound possible that Jesus walked on water. It might not sound possible that people were raised from the dead. Lazarus, he was four days in tomb. He was as dead as dead could be. It might not sound possible. But for God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is too fantastical for God. Our, imagine, our imaginations, they can't even begin to fathom the, the faintest sliver of what God is able to do. God is the creator of everything that exists. All things are possible for him. All things are possible for him to achieve. He has no limits. And because of that, he is worth following. He is trustworthy, and he is an unbreakable protector. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. We'll be going through verses 16 to 30. And it is the story of the rich young ruler. The man that's just such a bad example, right? Well, he is in a couple ways, that's for sure, but in the way that we usually think of him as a bad example, I don't really know if he is. None of us really know if he is. 
He's more of a real example, one that really should cut deep into our own hearts. We often don't find it easy to choose God over material goods. So why would he find it easy? Let's read Matthew 19, verses 16 to 30. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold, and will, in, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Lord, as we enter this time and we look into your word, just be with each one of us, working on each one of our hearts. Be with me as I speak. If I say anything that might be wrong or untrue, I just pray that that would not be believed. In the name of Jesus, I do not want to lead anyone astray. But I pray that your truths that are spoken would be remembered, would be taken to heart, would be believed in the name of Jesus, and that you would be at work in each one of our hearts, giving us understanding of your word. And just, yeah, growing us in you as we hear this. Again, challenge us where we need to be challenged in the name of Jesus. But also encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Pray this in the name of Jesus. And ultimately, be glorified, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's a quote from C.T. Studd, and its truth really resonates. We have only one life here on earth. Soon it will be past. And what matters then are not the material things that we've acquired. What matters then is not the successes that we've had. What matters then is not our own legacy that we have built. What matters then is just what we've done for Christ. Have we given our lives to Him in faith? Have we worked hard to serve Him with our lives? Have we taken up our cross to follow Jesus no matter who may have been against us? Maybe even friends or family? Have we shared the gospel with people? Have we worked hard to help each other grow? Sometimes through hard truths that we need to hear, but also, of course, through encouraging one another when we see each other. If we know God has called us somewhere, have we followed? Those are the things that matter. Those are the things that have lasting significance. Only one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last. We briefly mentioned last week that God can call people to some very hard things. 
A famous example of that is Jim Elliott, who was called to serve in Ecuador, where the tribe he was trying to minister to killed him. Eventually, a lot of that tribe would come to Christ, but not before they killed him. His mentality for following Christ's call is summed up in this famous quote where he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. A paraphrase of an earlier quote by famous commentary writer Matthew Henry's father, Philip, Philip Henry said, He is no fool who parts with that which he cannot keep when he is sure to be recompensed with that which he cannot lose. Let me repeat that. He is no fool who parts with that which he cannot keep when he is sure to be recompensed with that which he cannot lose. With your genuine repentant faith in the Lord Jesus and his work for you on the cross, dying for your sins, and in his resurrection from the dead, because of the grace of God, a reward of eternal life in heaven has been secured for you. So if God calls you to do something while here on earth, even if it is hard, even if it's difficult, it's not worthless. It's not in vain. Your reward is still coming to you once you leave this earth. So whatever it may be, if God has called you to it, you should surely do it. I think the real saying is if God has called you to it, he will guide you through it. And that's true too. Uh, take comfort in that you can rely on God. And you should take him up on that help unless you want to fail. But for the sake of this passage, let's go with if God has called you to it, you should surely do it. There's another saying too that says if God brings you to it, he will bring you through it. Uh, that one's a little different because maybe he won't. Like Jim Elliot, he passed away. He wasn't brought through that calling. And sometimes that's the same for other Christians, right? But whether or not God brings you through what he calls you to, you should still take the advice. If God has called you to it, you should surely do it. Okay, so that's a lot of quotes from outside the Bible. Let's look again at the Bible. Verse 16, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Now, we've seen a lot of Pharisees come to Jesus with questions, but this is, of course, different. The Pharisees usually come to Jesus and they, they try to test him. They try to make him say something that will get him in trouble with, with somebody. But you can tell by the end of this story that this rich young ruler is actually interested in following Jesus because he shows a sorrowful response. Jesus then responds, and he said to him, Why do you ask me what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? This is where the rich young ruler is a bad example, right here where he says, all these I have kept. It all builds up to this, Jesus reveals this man's understanding. First of all, the rich young ruler is asking about doing good deeds in order to receive eternal life. Is there you know, one good deed that can bring him eternal life? Jesus says, keep the commandments, which, I mean, can bring him eternal life if you're perfect, which nobody is. So Jesus being correct here doesn't mean he gives something that can actually be achieved. But... Uh, that's where the rich young ruler falls short. He thinks that it can be achieved. He thinks he has been good enough. 
Now, he probably doesn't know that, you know, hatred is murder in one's heart, and lust is adultery in one's heart, but just because someone doesn't know they're in the wrong doesn't mean they're not in the wrong. One of the things that we cannot be thinking as Christians is that we're perfect, that we've done nothing wrong. In fact, coming to Christ in the first place needs to include repentance. And what repentance can there be if you don't think you have anything to repent of? We need to know that we've sinned against God in order to make things right with Him. The thing is, we can't make things right with Him by any good deed that we do. Now that Jesus continued to live a perfect life after this story and went on to die on the cross for our sins and rise again, the good deeds that are required for getting to heaven have been done. Your debt has been paid in Christ Jesus. So your good deeds that you do now should not be done from a point of view of, oh, I hope this helps me get into heaven. No. You gained access to heaven by God's grace when you placed your faith in Christ. You already have access. So your good deeds that you do now should instead be done from the roots from the perspective of Jesus has done this for me, so let me do this for him. Anyways, that's the stuff that we see from the rich young ruler that is a bad example. The next thing the rich young ruler does, we again don't actually know if it's a bad example or not. But before we get there, there is this detail that Matthew doesn't actually record in his telling of the story that Mark does that I really want to touch on. So we'll read this next part from the Gospel of Mark. It says, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Loved him. Even though we may misunderstand or be trapped in our own delusion, thinking that we're all that, Jesus still loves us. And he wants us to come to know him. He wants us to change and go in the right direction toward him. Jesus loves this rich young ruler. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus invites him to follow him, but it comes at a cost. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. God can call people to some very hard things. He calls this rich young ruler to sell everything he has and to give it to the poor. And does the rich young ruler do that? We do not know, actually. We do not know what he ended up doing. It doesn't tell us. It, it seems like he rejected Jesus, especially later when Peter says, see, we have followed you. But nowhere does it tell us whether the rich young ruler listened to Jesus or not. Jesus tells him, go and sell all that he has. And when he went away sorrowfully, we don't really see what he does after. Where did he go away to? Did he go to sell all that he had? We don't know. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. You might say, well, of course he didn't. He was sorrowful. He was sad. Well, if you had to sell everything you had, You'd be sad too. Of course he was sad. If you had to give up your home, your, your possessions, your, your most treasured things, it's, it's not easy to give everything up. So maybe he didn't go and sell everything and that's why he was sad. Or maybe he was sad because, like most people interpret, he wanted Jesus but he couldn't get himself to sell everything he had in order to follow him. We just don't know. Either way, though, it shows that it is a difficult choice. Verse 23, And Jesus said to his disciples, 
Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will the rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. It is a difficult thing to give everything up. Of course it is. But again, Jesus says difficulty in this passage. Difficulty. Only with difficulty will the rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say impossible. The thing is, though, without God, it is impossible because of what Jesus says next. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You know how big a camel is, roughly, and you know how small, tiny the hole of a needle is, the eye of a needle. Like, obviously, that doesn't fit. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Then who can be saved? Who then can be saved? This is an impossible thing. If it's that hard, if that's how hard it is, who can ever enter the kingdom of heaven? Rick from Brighton, UK, says, This, or sorry, the interpretation that seems to make sense is this. The eye of the needle was indeed a narrow gateway into Jerusalem. Since camels were heavily loaded with goods and riders, they would need to be unloaded in order to pass through. Therefore, the analogy is that a rich man would have to similarly unload his material possessions in order to enter heaven. That's actually the same, that's actually the same interpretation as my high school teacher taught us. But uh, is that what Jesus means? That the eye of the needle is actually this tiny gateway into Jerusalem? I feel like that would not cause the disciples to go, who then can be saved, as if it's an impossible thing to get through. What about this explanation from William Elson? He says, no, the failure is in the translation. The original word that should have been translated was camella, which means rope. It is easier for a rope to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven makes more sense as a comparison. This is another common argument that's made, but still, it feels like an attempt to make things seem more possible when what Jesus says, the next thing he actually says is, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Sometimes we take the Bible and we try too hard to make it fit our own framework. We might think, oh, that seems way too fantastical. There must be some other way this could work. But what seems fantastical to us, God can do. God can do. Remember what we read in Ezekiel. How fantastical did that seem? And yet, that's how things are in the spiritual realm that we can't see. I don't know how God would make a camel fit through the eye of a needle. Maybe he shrinks the camel. Maybe he makes the eye of the needle bigger. Maybe he morphs the atoms of the camel so that it goes through like a string. But that's not the point. The point is, for us, that's impossible. That's impossible. The disciples ask, who then can be saved? Jesus says, with man this is impossible. Who can be saved? With man it's impossible to be saved. But with God, again, all things are possible. Which reminds us again of how we cannot work our way to heaven. How Jesus saves, not us. How being allowed into heaven is not about how good the deeds we do are, or how many of them we do. No, it's about trusting in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God does what we can't. He's the ruler of all, seated in sapphire with the colors of the rainbow shining all around him. He speaks a word and it comes into existence. He can create and he can annihilate. 
anything. And he does. Like he does to that rich young ruler. He loves you. He does love you. He still loves you. He did your impossible for you. Living perfectly, taking your punishment of death, rising again. And because of that, he is worth following. He's trustworthy. And he is an unbreakable protector. If God calls you to something difficult, remember who he is. All-knowing. He knows your future, how things will end. He's only sending you into your unknown, not his. He's all-powerful. No one can steal the gift of salvation that he gave you, right? It may be difficult to lose some things. It might be very difficult. But you'll never lose everything because you have a permanent gift in Christ Jesus and a permanent inheritance as well. He's also omnipresent. He's always with you wherever you go. Wherever he calls you, he will be there with you. You are never alone. If you're called away from your family, your loved ones, your friends, many missionaries are, he's still always there. In fact, what we see in the last part of this passage is that there is reward for those who are called away from their families. Verse 27, then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's, uh, that one is pretty exclusive to the twelve disciples right there. But then it says, And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold. There's rewards in heaven, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Uh, the, this, this idea of the first being last and the last being first will be fleshed out in a parable in the start of the next chapter. Um, but the idea for most of this whole passage is that no matter what you have to give up, as hard as that might be, it is worth it for the sake of the kingdom. It is worth it for the sake of Jesus. Because all that stuff is going to go away anyway when you pass from this earth. All of it's gone. You leave it behind. And he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. As Jesus said earlier in Matthew, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or, if you have come to Christ, if you have placed that, that genuine faith in Him, but you don't want to do what He's calling you to do, what profit is it to the Master who bled and died for you if you gain the whole world and forfeit the souls of others? If God has called you, to it, you should surely do it. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, you are so good. You are an amazing master, and again, we read how high and unimaginable you are, and just the most powerful being that has ever been, ever will be, how you still come down and live a life on earth, how you still love us that much, how you love the rich young ruler, how you love those who even hate you. 
enough to die for them? That is amazing, Lord. And we want to serve you because of what you've done for us and because of your great love and help us to do that in the name of Jesus. But of course, some of the things that happen are not easy at all. Some of the things that we are called to give up or even that we just lose, that we don't feel called to give up, but then all of a sudden they're just gone. That's hard. That's so hard. But in the midst of all that, you are still good. And in the midst of that, we should still trust you. Help us to know that we're never alone. No matter where we go, no matter who's here or there, we're never alone because you're with us. Help us to know that. Help us to remember your goodness. And just grow us to be better servants of you so that we can spread the light of your gospel, the light of your love, to people who don't know you. Or to people that have heard about you, but don't want you. Because maybe that will change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.